15. The Hunt I float in the back of the trash collector with the howlers. It's dark. The night vision of my optics show the garbage that orbits us in shadowy green. Banana pills, toy packaging, coffee grounds. Victor makes a gagging sound over the calm as toilet paper sticks to her face. Her mask is a demon helm, like mine. Its pupil black and shaped subtly, like a screaming demon face. Fitchner managed to steal them from Luna's armories for the suns more than a year back. With them, we could see most spectrums, amplify sound, track one another's coordinates, access maps, and communicate silently. My friends around me are all in black. We wear no mechanized armor, only thin scarab skin over our bodies that will stop knives and occasional projectiles. We have no grab boots or pulse armor, nothing that will slow us cause noise or trip sensors. We wear oxygen tanks with air enough for 40 minutes. I finish readjusting Ragnar's harness and look to my datapad. The two reds crewing the old trash collector are giving us a countdown. When it reaches one, Severo says, Tuck your sacks and pop your cloaks. I activate my ghost cloak and the world warps, distorted by the cloak. It's like looking through refracted, dirty water and I already feel the battery pack heating up against my tailbone. The cloak's good for short bursts, but it burns up small batteries like the ones we pack and needs time to cool and recharge. I grope for several in Victor's hands, managing to grasp them in time. The rest partner up as well. I don't remember feeling so frightened before the iron rain. Was I braver then? Maybe just more naive. Hold tight, we're in for some chop, Severo says. Popping top in three, two. I tighten my grip on his hand. One. The collector's door retracts silently, bathing us in the amber light of a hollow display screen on a nearby skyscraper. There's a burst of air, and my world spins as the trash collector ejects its load of garbage from the back of its hold. We're like seed chaff thrown into the city spinning with debris through a kaleidoscope world of towers and advertisements. Hundreds of ships funneling along avenues, all a flashing liquid blur. We continue to spin head over heel to mask our signatures. Over the calm, I hear the grousing of a blue traffic controller, annoyed at the spilled trash. Soon there's a company copper on the line threatening to fire the incompetent drivers. But it's what I don't hear. That makes me smile. The police channels drone on their usual slant, reporting a syndicate airjacking in the hive, a grisly murder in the ancient art museum near the park plaza, a data center robbery in the banking cluster. They haven't seen us amidst the debris. We slow our spin gradually, using small thrusters in our helmet. Bursts of air bring us to a steady drift, silent in the vacuum. We're on target. Along with the rest of the trash, we're about to impact on the side of a steel tower. Has to be a clean landing. Victor curses as we drift closer. Closer. My fingers tremble. Don't bounce. Don't bounce. Release, several orders. I pull my hands from his and Victor's, and the three of us impact jarringly against the steel. The trash around us bounds off the metal, cartwheeling backward at odd angles. Severo and Victra stick, compliments of magnets in their gloves, but a piece of debris impacting in front of me bounces off the steel and hits me in the thigh, altering my trajectory, tipping me sideways, hands windmilling for a grip, which causes me to spin. My feet hit first and I bounce backward towards space, cursing. Severo! I shout. Victra, get him! A hand grabs my foot, jerking me to a halt. I look down and see a warped, invisible form grasping my leg. Victra. Carefully, she pulls my weightless body back to the wall, so I can clamp my own magnets onto the steel. Spots race across my vision. The city is all around us. 
It's dreadful in its silence, in its colors, in its inhumane metal landscape. It feels more like an ancient alien artifact than a place for humans. Slow it down, Victor's voice crackles in my helmet. Daryl, you're hyperventilating. Breathe with me. In, out, in. I force my lungs to breathe in sync with her. The spots soon fade. I open my eyes, face inches from the steel. You shit your suit or something? Severo asks. I'm good, I say. A little rusty. Ah, pun intended, I'm sure. Ragnar and the rest of the howlers land thirty meters beneath us on the wall. Pebble waves up to me. Got three hundred meters to go. Let's climb, you pixies. Lights glow behind the glass of Quicksilver's double helix towers. Connecting the double helixes are nearly two hundred levels of offices. I can make out shapes moving inside at computer terminals. I zoom in with my optics to watch the stock traders sitting in their offices, their assistants moving to and fro, analysts signaling furiously on holographic trading boards that communicate with the markets on Luna. Silvers all. They remind me of industrious bees. Makes me miss the boys, Victra says. Takes me a moment to realize she's not talking about the silvers. The last time she and I tried this tactic, Tactus and Roke were with us. We infiltrated Karnas' flagship from vacuum as he refueled at an asteroid base during the Academy's mock war. We cut through his hole with aims of kidnapping him to eliminate his team. But it was a trap, and I narrowly escaped with the help of my friends. A broken arm, my only reward for the gambit. It takes us five minutes to climb from our landing place to the peak of the tower, where it becomes a large crescent. We don't go hand over hand, so climbing isn't the true term. The magnets in our gloves have fluctuating positive and negative currents that allow us to roll up the side of the tower like we have wheels in our palms. The toughest part of the ascent, or descent, or whatever you call it in the null gravity, is the crescent slope at the extreme height or end of the tower. We have to cling to a narrow metal support beam that extends out among a ceiling of glass, much like the stem of a leaf. Beneath our bellies and through the glass lies Quicksilver's famous museum. And above us, just over the peak of Quicksilver's tower, hangs Mars. My planet seems larger than space. Larger than anything ever could be. A world of billions of souls, of designer oceans, mountains, and more irrigable acres of dry land than Earth ever had. It's night on this side of the world, and you can never know that millions of kilometers of tunnels wind through the bones of the planet, that even as its surface glows with the lights of the thousand cities of Mars, there is a pulse unseen. A tide that is rising. But now it looks peaceful. War a distant, impossible thing. I wonder what a poet would say in this moment. What Roke would whisper into the air. Something about the calm before the storm. Or a heartbeat among the deep. But then there's a flash. It startles me. A spasm of light that flares white then erodes into devilish neon as a mushroom grows in the planet's blackness. Do you see that? I ask over the comms, blinking away the cigar burn the distant detonation made in my vision. Our comms crackle with curses as the others turn to see. Shit, several murmurs. New Thebes? No, Pebble answers. Farther north, that's the Aventine Peninsula. So it's probably Cyprion. Last intel said the real legion was moving toward the city. Then comes another flash, and the seven of us hunker motionless on the crest of the building, watching as a second nuclear bomb detonates a thumb's distance away from the first. Bloody damn! Is it us or them? I ask. Several! I don't know! Several says impatiently. You don't know? Victor asks. 
How could he not know? I want to shout. But I grasp the answer because Dancer's words now haunt me. Savro's not running this war, he told me. Weeks ago, after another failed Howler mission, he's just a man pouring gas on the fire. Maybe I didn't understand how far gone this war is. How far reaching the chaos has become. Could I have been wrong to trust him so blindly? I watch his expressionless mask. The skin of his armor drinks in the colors of the city around, reflecting nothing. An abyss for light. He turns slowly from the explosion and begins to climb again, already moving on. Hollow News has it, Pebble says. Fast. They say Red Legion used nukes against gold forces near Cyprion. At least that's the story. Bloody damn liars, Clown snaps. Another bait and switch. Where would Red Legion get nukes? Victor asks. Harmony would use them if she had any. But I wager it was gold using the bombs on Red Legion instead. Doesn't mean shit to us now. Lock it up, Silvero says. Still got to do what we came to do. Get your asses in gear. Numbly, we obey. We reach our entry zone on the crescent of the double helix tower. Rehearsed routine takes over. I pull a small acid flask from the pack on Victor's back. Several releases a nanocam, no larger than my fingernail, into the air, where it hovers above the glass, scanning for life inside the museum. There is none. Not a surprise at three o'clock. He pulls out a pulse generator and waits for Pebble to finish her work on her data pad. What's what, Pebble? He asks impatiently. Code's worked. I'm in the system, she says. Just have to find the right zone. There it is. Laser grid is down. Thermal cams are frozen. Heartbeat sensors are off. Congratulations, everyone. We're officially ghosts. As long as no one manually pulls an alarm. Severo activates the pulse generator, and a faint iridescent bubble blooms around us, creating a seal so that the vacuum of space doesn't invade the building with us. Would be a quick way to be discovered. I put a small suction cup on the center of the glass, then open up the acid container and apply the foam to the window in a two meter by two meter box around the suction cup. The acid bubbles as it eats through the glass, creating an opening with a small rush of air from the building into our pulse field. The glass pane pops up where Victor grabs it to keep it from flying into space. Rags first, Severo says. It's a hundred meters to the museum floor. Ragnar clamps a repelling winch to the edge of the glass and clips his harness to the magnetic wire. Pulling his razor out, he reactivates his ghost cloak and pushes through the hole. It's disturbing to the senses, seeing his near-invisible form accelerate down to the floor, gripped by the skyhook's artificial gravity while I'm still floating. He looks a demon, made of the heat that shimmers above the desert on a summer day. Clear. Several follows. Break an arm, Victor says, pushing me into the hole after him. I float forward, then feel myself gripped by gravity as I cross the boundary into the room. I slide down the wire, picking up speed. My stomach lurches at the sudden influx of weight, food sloshing around. I land hard on the ground, almost twisting my ankle as I pull up my silent scorcher and search for contacts. The rest of the howlers land behind me. We crouch back to back in the grand hall. The floor is gray marble. The length of the hall is impossible to gouge, because it curves according to the crescent, bowing upward and out of sight, playing with gravity and giving me a sense of vertigo. Metal relics tower around us, old rockets from man's pioneer age. The coat of arms of Luna Company marks the hull of a gray probe near Ragnar. It looks decidedly like Octavia Aulun's house crest. So this is what it's like to feel fat. Severo says with a grunt as he takes a small jump in the heavy gravity. Disgusting. Quicksilver's from Earth, Victra says. Jacks it up even higher when he's negotiating with anyone from low-grav birthplaces. 
It's three times what I'm used to on Mars. Eight times what they prefer on Iowa or Europa. But in rebuilding my body, Mickey jacked the simulators up to twice Earth's gravity. It's an unpleasant sensation weighing nearly 800 pounds, but it works the muscles something horrible. We strip our oxygen takes and stow them in the engine room of an old space shuttle painted with the flag of pre-Empire America. So we're left with our small packs, scarab skin, demon helms, and weapons. Several pulls up Victor's crude map of the tower's interior and asks Pebble if she found Quicksilver yet. I can't. It's old. The cameras are off in the top two levels. Same with biometric radars. Can't pinpoint him like we planned. Off? I ask. Maybe he's having an orgy, or waking off and doesn't want his security to see. Several grunts with a shrug. Either way, he's hiding something, so that's where we're headed. I cue several's personal lines so the others can't hear us. We can't wander around looking for him. If we're caught in the halls without leverage, we won't wander. He cuts me off before addressing the howlers. Cloaks on, ladies. Razors and silent scorchers. Pulse fits only if shit gets dirty. He ripples transparent. Howlers, on me. We sling from the museum into a maze of otherworldly hallways. Following Severo's lead. Floors of black marble. Walls of glass. Ten meter high ceilings made from pulse fields, which look into aquariums where vibrant reefs of corals stretch like fungal tentacles. Reptilian mermaids, one foot long with humanoid faces, gray skin, and skulls shaped like crowns, swim through a kingdom of scalding blue and violent orange. Hateful little crow eyes glare down at us as they pass. The walls are mood glass and pulse with subtle alternating colors. Now heartbeats of magenta, soon rippling curtains of cobalt silver. It's dreamlike. Amidst the maze are little alcoves, miniature art galleries, showcasing works of contemporary dot holographs and 21st century A.D. ostentatiousism instead of the reserved neoclassical Romanism so in vogue with peerless scarred. Recharging our battery packs to our ghost cloaks, we duck into a gallery where lurks a gaudy purple metallic dog shaped like a balloon animal. Victor sighs. Gory hell. Man's got the taste of a tabloid socialite. Ragnar cocks his head at the dog. What is it? Art, Victor says. Supposedly. The tone of condescension Victor strikes intrigues me, as does the building. It pulses with artifice. The art, the walls, the mermaids. All so on the nose of what the peerless scarred would expect of a newly moneyed silver. Quicksilver must know gold psychology intimately in order to have been allowed to grow so wealthy. So I wonder, is this extravagance all something far more clever? A mask so obvious and easy to accept that no one would ever think to look beneath it. Quicksilver for all his reputation, has never been called stupid. So perhaps this tawdry dreamscape isn't for him. It's for his guests, which makes me think something here is amiss, as we reach an unlit atrium with unpolished sandstone floors perforated by pink jasmine trees and slink across the floor in a V formation toward the set of double doors that lead to Quicksilver's bedroom suite. Cloaks deactivated so we could better see. Razors rigid and held out. Metal drifting centimeters above the sandstone. This isn't a home. It's a stage. Made to manipulate. Sinister in the cold calculation with which it was constructed. I don't like it. I key several's frequency again. Something's wrong here. Where are the servants? The guards? Maybe he likes his privacy. I think it's a trap. A trap? Your head or your gut talking? My gut. He's quiet for a breath. And I wonder if he's speaking to someone else on the other line. Maybe he's speaking to all of them. What's your wreck? Pull back 
assess the situation to see. Pull back, he snaps the question out. For all we know, they just dropped nukes on our people. We need this. I try to interrupt, but he steamrolls me. Shit, I've run 13 ops just to get intel on this silvery asshole. We leave now, that's all slagged. They'll know we were here. We won't have this chance again. He's the key to getting the jackal. You gotta trust me, Reap. Do you? I bite back a curse and cut the signal short. Not sure if I'm angry with him or with myself, or because I know the jackal removed the spark that made me feel different. Every opinion I have, feeble and malleable to others, because I know, deep down, beneath the intimidating scarab skin, beneath the demon mask, is a callow little boy who cried because he was scared of being alone in the dark. Purple light suddenly floods the room as a luxury vessel cruises past the wall of windows at our back. We hastily line up to the other side of the door to Quicksilver's suite, preparing to breach. I watch the vessel drift along through my black optics. Lights pulse on one of its decks as several hundred pixies writhe to some Etrurian club beat that's all the rage on far-off Luna. As if war didn't wage on the planet beneath this moon. As if we didn't move to rupture their way of life. They'll drink champagne from Earth and clothes made on Venus and ships fueled by Mars. And they'll laugh and consume and screw and face no consequences. So many little locusts. I feel Severus' righteous wrath burn in me. Suffering isn't real to them. War isn't real. It's just a three-letter word for people that they see in the digital news feeds. Just a stream of uncomfortable images they skip past. A whole business of weapons and arms and ships and hierarchies they don't even notice. All to shield these fools from the true agony of what it means to be human. Soon, they'll know. And on their deathbeds, they'll remember tonight who they were with. What they were doing when that three-letter word gripped them and never let go. This pleasure cruise, this hideous decadence, is the last gasp of the Golden Age. And what a pathetic gasp it is. Of course I trust you, I say, tightening my grip on my razor. Ragnar's watching us, even though he can't hear our signal. Victra's waiting to breach the door. The lights fade and the ship disappears into the cityscape. I'm surprised to realize I don't feel satisfaction in knowing what's about to happen, in knowing their age will fall. Neither does it bring joy to think of all the lights in all the cities across this empire of man, dimming, or all the ships slowing, or all the brilliant golds fading as their buildings rust and crumble. Would that I could hear Mustang take on this plan. Before, I've missed her lips, her scent. But now I miss the comfort that comes from knowing her mind is aligned with mine. When I was with her, I did not feel so alone. She'd probably chastise us for focusing on breaking rather than building. Why do I feel this way now? I'm surrounded by friends. Striking at gold as I've always wished. Yet something itches in the back of my brain. Like eyes watch me. Whatever Severo says, something is wrong here. Not just in this building, but with this plan. Is this how I would have done it? How Fitchner would have done it? If it succeeds, what do we usher in after the dust has settled? and the helium no longer flows. A dark age. Severo is a force unto himself. His rage a thing to move mountains. I was once like that. And look what that got me. Kill his gods, stun the pinks, smash, grab, and go. Severo was saying to his howlers. My hand tightens on my blade. He gives the signal and Ragnar and Victra slip through the door. The rest of us follow into the dark. <laughs>